Hi, hello everybody, good morning, good morning. Happy noon, happy good afternoon, happy good morning. Thank you everybody for participating in our webinar series. This is 2021-2022. Hi everybody, I'm Jennifer Ann Cook, Jack. I'm your host for this event. And this is hosted by CSD Core, California School for the Deaf Core. C stands for curriculum, outreach, resources, and education. So we are a training group, we're called Core. So I am part of the outreach component. And so we've taken on this webinar series because the, this is a national level with the COVID pandemic situation. We've been providing trainings for teachers, uh, teachers of the deaf, uh, teachers of the deaf and hard of hearing programs. And when COVID hit, we've switched the format to webinars. Actually, last year we started that series. And we're you know, starting to see people join and seeing different topics they're wanting to address. And Jack is freezing a little bit. So we're just checking her connection. Okay. So we've noticed universally there's some consistencies about topics and areas of benefit um, that could be heard at the national level. So continuing this series into 2021, 2022 on various topics. So I would like to mention a couple of housekeeping items. Um, we do have the chat feature. And so in the chat feature, I can see the people have already started at adding their comments, you know, people who've come to the webinars, they say, hello, how's everybody doing? That's what you should put in the chat. Definitely love the energy and spirit that's there. So your feelings, your reflections, your aha moments, you know, those types of, of comments should be put in the chat. If you have questions, specifically Q and A, things that you would like to be answered, so for Julie Rems Mario to answer your question, um, some specific topic that maybe she's talked about, that's what you wanna put in the Q&A section. So we will monitor the Q&A area and at the very end, we will, I will pop on screen again and translate your questions from English to ASL. And then Julie is able to read the question or see me and provide an answer to your question. If time runs out, fear not, that's okay. We're gonna take those questions from the Q&A section and we'll share them out with Julie. And then Julie will have a chance to put together a curated response to those questions. So this webinar is being recorded. So you're also able to see the recording. Um, and then once we have everything all cleaned up and polished, we'll go ahead and disseminate that out to the registrants and to the public. So before we proceed, and before I turn my video off, I want to introduce Julie Remsamario. We also have Spanish interpretation and an English interpreter. So for Spanish interpretation, I wanna make sure families who wish to hear this webinar in Spanish have the ability to do so. You can click onto the global icon. It looks like the world, it's on to your far right on the bottom, click that, click Spanish, Spanish, and then you're able to hear uh, Spanish interpretation for this webinar. Okay. So I have the pleasure to invite our next speaker for this webinar today. This is Dr. Julie Rems Smario. And she is our early start education consultant specialist. And so she's part of this core team that I had mentioned before. She has a wealth of knowledge talking about how we can fit you know, her experience, her range of knowledge with uh, regarding language deprivations, AB 210, Lead K. Uh, she's been involved with so many different uh, points of, of the deaf education spectrum. And so she's been a long time participant in domestic violence and sexual violence prevention um, and sexual assault training. She was one of the founders of Deaf Hope. Um, so we're really happy to have her uh, on board with CSD this year. Her topic, uh, actually this is part of her dissertation. 
So deaf educators, their wealth of knowledge is the title of this presentation. So welcome, Julie. I'll go ahead and turn it over on to you. Thank you, thank you. Let me go ahead and pull up my PowerPoint presentation. Thank you for that. It's been so nice to work with you as well. Well, hello everybody. Thanks for the invitation to be able to present to you today. Uh, before I proceed, I want to let everybody know um, this potentially has some trigger warnings, um, potentially some trauma trigger warnings. Um, so I do want to make sure I give that. So there are some trigger warnings. So we will be talking a lot about our upbringing, our experience within the educational system, including autism. So I do want to provide that, that there are moments in this presentation that might you might be triggered. Um, so I just wanted to important that you know that. Um, so if you need to have some tissues or make yourself comfortable as you're watching this webinar, make sure that you have a chance to ground yourself in your space. Because there are some areas of trigger, um, I do want to talk about that. We are all in this together. I know that I am not alone, you're not alone, but I want to put this painting, actually you see this on the front, this is from Nancy Work. She is an artist, a Devia artist, and this is actually entitled Deep Scar. And so it's not necessarily a, a negative meaning, um, but it's something that potentially can benefit us as educators. So this presentation is entitled Deaf Educators Wealth of Knowledge. And I've actually taken a lot of this information from my dissertation that I defended last year. I've adapted it to make it a little bit easier for us to follow for the webinar today. So two things that are important to talk about is autism and systematic autism. So this is important vocabulary before we dive in. So autism is actually a concept created by Dr. Tom Humphreys. And it's the idea that a person considers themselves superior because of their ability to hear or act like a person who can hear. The second one is systematic autism. So those are corporations or the medical industries, uh, educational system could be part of this as well, that deal with deaf people in a hearing way trying to restructure and have authority over the deaf community. And that also includes areas of deaf education. So we'll be focusing on these two specific topics. When I'm talking about the medical system, really what's behind the medical system is capitalism. So that is a topic for a whole nother webinar. Uh, we will be talking about capitalism and how that affects deaf education and the medical model. Um, so keep that in the back of your head, but this specifically, I'll refer to this uh, webinar, the medical system and the educational system and how that impacts autism. So Mask of Benevolence was a book by Harlan Lane. And that's where we came up with the systematic autism definition. So I want to focus on three problems that I've been working on within my dissertation. And so I completed my dissertation last year and was able to defend that, but focusing on the first one here, medical and ed the educational model. So the first, you know, families who have deaf babies, the first person they meet is the doctor, an audiologist, a speech language pathologist. It is ingrained into the newborn hearing system and the medical system. So, and trying to switch to more of an early start focus and having some linkages there. So under special education, they often focus on the deficit model and trying to fix the deaf child, only focusing on either the, their voice or their ability to hear, not necessarily focusing on the whole child. And it's to the point where they're actually rejecting the use of sign language. Number two, systematic autism. 
So the medical and educational professions who are supporting or, or um, encouraging this framework are um, excluding deaf individuals from the community that have wealth of knowledge to be able to support the unequal uh, model. <clears throat> Number three, the exclusion of deaf professionals and their knowledge. So their knowledge isn't centered into the newborn hearing screening system or an early start system. That's not where their centered is. That's where the medical model is ingrained in and those two specific areas. So deaf people, we have a lifetime of knowledge and experience. We know what it's like to be deaf. We've navigated the systems ourselves. We have firsthand experience and knowledge. We know what it's like to be marginalized. We have expertise to be able to offer these families, but families aren't getting the access to those resources from us. And more often than not, are, are not even meeting deaf people. I used to be president of California Association of the Deaf, and I received, you know, loads and loads of old documentation. And there was a president, actually in 1914. He was a president, president principal of the California School for the Deaf back in 1914. Their name is Milligan, and so now we call them superintendent. But back then, we used to call it principal of the school. So Milligan wrote this here. So the reason that this letter was written, they sent this to the school for the deaf and blind saying, I'm not in favor of sacrificing the mental development of the deaf child on the altar of pure oral method that these, these teachers who know ASL are being switched out to only spoken English teachers teaching deaf children. So they responded that they're not in favor of switching out these ASL teachers to spoken English teachers on the altar of the pure old method, that they were not in favor. And so that we have to, as parents, you know, they were adamant. They said, that's what we wanted on campus. That's the model we want you to teach our children. So you have to be, they have to teach their children and educate the children in the oral model. This, what, this happened in 1914. So it was more about the parents and the political climate, not necessarily about the child. And so this happened way a long time ago before special education. Okay, we're gonna try to go a little bit slower for the interpretation process. So you know the problem of oral education is that it's tied with parents and the parents' choice. The parents were almost unanimous, unanimously adamant about how they wanted their child to be taught. And so it was more about the construction of the political climate than about what the child needs. Even the principal at the California School for the Deaf admitted sacrificing to what the parent wanted instead of what was best for the child. So even today, this is still perpetuated. The medical profession, the deficit that they're focusing on only the auditory ability or their speech ability and how it's focused with uh, the NHSP, which is the newborn hearing screening program. So that framing is now passed on to the families. So the medical education professional is only focusing on their hearing ability or speech ability and often is disencouraging sign language and because it's um, missing those language milestones. Now, families with infants who are immediately socialized into the medical system, into that culture, into their script, and their typical dialogue about having to fix the child, not talking about language or culture. None of that is presented to the parents. So 
So deaf professionals have a lifetime of experience, expertise, resources. We have have a lived experience as deaf individuals. I could say I was born deaf, I was raised deaf, I'm gonna die deaf. Yeah, you know, so the audiologists, the professionals that are out there or me, who has a better wealth of knowledge? I would say me. You know, often in my lifetime, my lived experience is discounted. It's not considered. It's not a part of the newborn hearing screening system. It's not part of the early start programs. Their script is to focus only on auditory and vocal functioning. With deaf professionals involved, there's a lot to gain. There's a lot more than just gaining language. They gain DCCW, which stands for Deaf Community Cultural Wealth. So there's so many other parts to our lived experience that isn't just about ASL or language. It's about you know the, our social ability, our navigation of our life, you know, the resistance, how we've stand up and advocated for ourselves. The families are missing those resources to be able to support their children. And what we have to offer can be passed on to the children because often those children aren't getting that access to that information. So then they have a serious identity crisis because they're missing that cultural competency of the DCCW that's passed on. And I, I'll emphasize that and expand that a little bit later. Most families aren't getting access to DCCW. Why? Why is that? That systematic autism. So these were my research questions. I have three. The first one is I wanting to know what are the experience and the understandings of deaf educational professionals that they have in regards to the newborn hearing screening program, NHSP, and related to the med med medical and educational programs? My second research question was what types of deaf community cultural wealth, DCCW, do deaf professionals possess? What do they have to offer? And third, how can we use these experience, the DCCW experience and their understandings to readdress some of the missing components of the system of the newborn hearing screening system? So these are my three research questions that I had for my dissertation. So with those research questions in mind, I started thinking about the theory framework, deaf crit, and deaf community cultural wit, wealth. And let me explain why. In this diagram, you see there's the oval circle. It says critical race theory, which we call CRIT crit. So taken from that, we have the deaf critical race theory. The reason we have that is because we're able to examine society and culture related to autism. Autism, different laws, policies, different power in the system and how all of that is implicated from autism. The red uh, squared box that you see, that's systematic autism. Systematic autism is caused by hearing people, which we call hearing supremacy. So, you know, essentially the notion that hearing people quote unquote are better than deaf people, that's their attitude. So looking into that attitude and seeing what that shows, what does hearing supremacy look like? And then what does systematic autism look like? So that we can have a better understand of, understanding of those two key points. Once we understand that, then we know how to change the system. We know how to tear it down and rebuild the system. And that's something that would work for all deaf children. Moving on more to the right, you see in the blue oval box, it says DCCW, that's the Deaf Community Cultural Wealth. These are the different um, areas that are mentioned here. You have social, educational, navigational, aspirational, resistant. I've also added, you see the yellow box here? I added the educational because I wanted to see what's going on in the educational system. So I've added that yellow, yellow circle.
So this is the data collection that I've done for my work from the different research. So I didn't do this alone. I had 13 deaf professionals onboarded with me that were involved in the systematic work because we wanted to, I wanted to know what their experience was. So there were five different activities. There was the timelining. So what do we know about the history of deaf education since essentially that it was founded in the 1860s, California School for the Deaf started in 1860. And what's happened since then, based on our knowledge throughout our history, and I gave permission to use the internet and find what we can from the web. So these 13 participants are my co-researchers. And so I, it's something I, you know, this is a monolith of, of, of information. I couldn't do it all on myself. So being able to use these other individuals to help out was very valuable. We did SWOT analysis, SWOT analysis, which was strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So that's looking at the current medical educational system. Third is the 13 resistant art pieces. So I used Nancy Rourke's uh, work. So if you remember the opening slide, I had deep scar that was done by Nancy Rourke. So we call this Nancy Rourkeism. So I'm using that art uh, with, it's using primary colors. So red, blue, yellow colors, very easy to understand and identify what's in the art. And it's showcasing individuals experience with systematic oppression and how we resist against it. Number four, the 13 affirmative art pieces, which was also using workism to be able to look at individual experiences and how they have had a positive experience. If they could have redesigned the system, what would that look like? And the last one was a Zoom recording of participants and their discussions. And so I'll show what happened. So the first one is the data timeline activity, I'm trying to figure out sort of a compilation of what's happened with deaf education. We had a school for the deaf that was established in Berkeley. First it was in San Francisco, then it was in Berkeley, and then eventually here in Fremont. And it was really interesting on how, with all of this analysis, looking at this timeline, there were three essentially waves of autism. We have three here. The very first wave of resistance happened there in the 1900s. That was around the time with the letter of the California Association of the Deaf sent to the principal of CSD that I had mentioned before. Because they were pushing out uh, sign language from the School for the Deaf. And so deaf community was using their resistant campaign against that. California Association for the Deaf, deaf clubs. And then later California School for the Deaf Riverside was actually set up by the deaf people and through California Association for the Deaf. CSUN, California State University Northridge, actually set up a national leadership training program. They had a degree in deaf studies. Larry Fleischer was a part of that. Uh, we had DeCara, Deaf Counseling Advocacy and Referral Agency, which is a nonprofit based here in the Bay Area. That's founded from a teacher from CSD. Dakara was one of the first, and now there's a total of eight deaf sister agencies. They're all focusing on advocacy. So they've all become part of the California Association for the Deaf. Yep, California Coalition of the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Agencies. Because of that, we have all of these services because of this one first wave, because of deaf people resisting because we had DCCW, because it was some hearing person's idea that they wanted to do this and we fought against it. We knew what was going on in the deaf education system. We wanted to make it better and make the best of deaf education. So with, all, with that came all of these other resources coming out of the deaf education system, which means that our our campaigns are, you know, it's not necessarily centered in the system, even today, it's not centered, it's not at the heart of it. 
we have so much knowledge and expertise and looking at all, all of the different infrastructure that we've created, but it's still essentially uh, cast aside off to the side. The second wave was um, re revived because of Deaf President Now, which we call DPN. And at the same time, co the cochlear implant industry started ramping up. So it started creeping up. It was in the 1980s. So that was the second wave of capital. So we have the Ch uh, Deaf Child's Bill of Rights, we have Bye Bye Education, we have the Deaf CDE Deaf and Hard of Hearing Unit, we have Parent Links, which is a parent group. We also have the California Newborn Hearing Screening Law. All of this was done by deaf people. So it's important to pay attention here to the last one. So the California Newborn Hearing Screening Program Law was curated by the deaf community, but actually taken over by the medical industry. They totally took it out from under us and not included us in it anymore. So hold that thought. The third wave was in the 2000s. California Universal Newborn Hearing, Squaw, Newborn Hearing Screening Law and AB 2072. So how many of you remember in 2010, we had a bad bill that was sponsored by the California Academ Academia Audiologist Options Schools. Does anybody remember that in 2010, where we fought against that bill? The entire deaf community totally revolted. We were entirely against that bill, and it was actually turned down and vetoed by the governor. So that was the third wave of capital resistance. And under these, we've listed the California Deaf Newborn, unfortunately, I can't remember what the IAS stands for at this time, but essentially it's a group of stakeholders who were concerned about the results of the newborn hearing screening program. That essentially that it wasn't going in the right direction and it was totally focused on, again, auditory um, functioning only. So then um, that led to um, AB 2072 protest. That became vetoed. So we did a big campaign, no to AB 2072, which then led to the Lead K campaign, which passed. And so that those, that's the language milestones bill for deaf children ages zero to five. See how it's all kind of tied. Now we have SB 210. So that is a law of providing language milestones to families and assessment to make sure that each deaf child is following along in meeting the age appropriate milestones. Last but not least, we now have statewide lead K family services. So if you can see within these three waves of autism brought out our resistance capital which led to all of these other pieces of infrastructure we have today. Without that capital, we wouldn't have all of these other resources. And all of that happened outside of the educational system, within the community, from people who volunteered, who rolled up their sleeves, gave commitment to this without pay. The newborn hearing screening program got $6 million towards the medical professionals. So keep that in mind. Moving on. So next we move on to the SWOT activities, S-W-O-T. Let's start with S, which stands for strengths. So the researchers, essentially my team of researchers, the 13 participants, found that deaf professionals have more than 220 years of scaffolded resistance work against the system of aut systematic autism, which helps to protect our DCCW knowledge. Without our resistance work, without our DCCW knowledge, this would not be protected. Weaknesses. This is weaknesses within the system. This is both uh, medical and, spe and special edge. This is ongoing 
uh, systematic exclusion of deaf professionals and their DCCW resources. Often they say negative things about us. They don't elevate us. So that's definitely changed. Threats. I think we missed one going back. I've got to go back, I've got to go back. <laughs> Opportunities, thank you, yes. Oh, for opportunities. We do have statewide lead K family services now, which refers all of the newborn babies to early start programs, which is part of their LEAs. Both California and EHDI system are the co-creators of this. So that's Sherry Farina and myself. Both of us are deaf women. So starting to bring this DCCW into the newborn hearing screening system and trying to overlay the two concepts. And this is a, a fantastic opportunity. Funding is HRSA, Health Resource Services Agency, HRSA, is where the funding comes from. And we just got the funding in April, 2020. So, so far we've already referred almost 2000 babies in the state of California since April of 2020. So that's our opportunity. Threats, there are four. So again, exclusion of deaf professionals and their expertise. We still see that, you know, um, early start and the medical models don't actually talk. Uh, the neutral binary language approach are often forcing families to choose one. So it's a binary language approach for families. They think they have to choose just one language. And often when they choose one, they're focusing on only the hearing and speech, but there's no resources for ASL or able to, you know, to meet within the deaf community, you know, having access to DCCW. The third is hyper focus on deaf children's listening and speaking, speaking skills. Too much focus. They're not focusing on language acquisition. The fourth is systematic hearing supremacy and dominance is still a reality. So here's the Divya art-based research. There are two parts to this. We have our resistance art, and then we have our affirmative art, so more of the positive side. So you'll see examples of a hearing baby, baby signing. You've seen, maybe you've seen the cartoon where a hearing baby signing and the deaf person can't, won't be allowed to sign, which is ironic. So we call that the greatest irony is what you see here. And the affirmative art is the whole deaf chi child signing is like the deaf child butterfly you know, they're able to see and sign and feel language and have an identity, open up to more opportunities, meet deaf people. That's the DCCW. So these are two examples of how our participants used this piece of art uh, to sort of express their experience via, via art. So let's focus on resistance art first. So you can see the artwork here. Just take a moment and take a look at the picture. You see the three heads, those are doctors. You see them with their stethoscope and with their old fashioned mirrored lamp. It says you must, must hear, talk. And the person's holding the baby and say, how? And it says, failed to hear. And you see it says zero sign language or it's banned, sign language is banned. So the person who's expressed their art says they feel that families are often lonely and scared and isolated, but they look to the wise ones, quote unquote, the medical profession. And many of our hearing parents don't know that they're not receiving the right guidance. That's the crux of the problem. So how can we start to provide opportunities earlier, 
using our DCCW and embedding that into their learning. Offering them information on ASL, access and tools and resources, our knowledge, but still they shift towards the cochlear implants without including us, which is really discouraging. So this is a def deficient based service for families is sort of the theme in this. And let me show you more related to that. I've got a couple of more. So this is Bella's experience. They added the sunshine around the heart to show the positivity of the deaf community and their excitement of being part of the deaf community. The black box you see around the heart shows the medical and the educational system and that they're always putting us in a box and limiting us. The gray background, you'll actually see eyes and lips, sort of eyes closed. That's the system of just focusing on hearing and speaking ability and that audiology. So if you look just outside the box, you see some other darker colors. You see yellows and a mixture of greens. So that's our access to the system that's not there. This is Emma's says that we did an activity where I would sign a picture and then the child would copy me. And the parents were shocked, but still the parents refused to learn sign language and decided to mainstream their child. So you see the hand here, a hand again is put in a circle. It's not a quote unquote box. It's not outside and free flowing. This one's from Jaden. You can see how there's two big ears with an FM and it's bodiless. So the FM system becomes the child's identity. With that FM system, you know, I could hear a little bit, it was really fuzzy. There was two other hearing teachers from deaf families, which we call CODAs. They signed great and I was able to understand them and learn language. But when you put the FM system on me, it just got in the way. And they were focusing on my hearing and speech ability instead of my learning of language. Mia said that she's from a hearing family. And so her entire life was dependent upon reading lips and speaking was limited to just those two. I thought that my world was small. I thought I was very isolated, just trying to read the lips. I didn't realize how much life I was missing out there. Knowledge and interactions and the life that was going on around me. So in the art, you see the world is just blocked. So all you're really seeing is just the lips. You're not actually seeing the entire world. Next, this one's from Lee. This is called Scales of DB, is the name of this artwork. Deciding, oh, you're, oh, you can hear some, so you have to stay in the mainstream setting, or oh, you're profoundly deaf, you can go to the deaf school. And they were frustrated because they came from a deaf family and they couldn't go to the deaf school where her family was from because she had some residual hearing. You know, I, they said they didn't understand me. I grew up in a deaf family. They didn't understand that I signed at home. They thought I would, was better off, um, you know, I would have been better off going to a deaf school, but that was the cult, the trade-off of having some hearing. Third here is systematic autism causing lifelong trauma. So this is from Brianna. Again, you can see there's more boxes here. They're trying to make me, the child, speak in order to fit in as a hearing child. And I felt compressed and condensed into this little box that I am a small person and that I didn't have my own voice and I had to keep the feelings to myself. I was boiling mad and I tried to fit their perfect quote unquote hearing ideology of who I was. So that's hearingization was the title of this, this piece of art. Emily says, on one side, you see the dreams. And on the other side, it says, no, you can't. And what you see is the rain, which is actually tears. The world is full of deaf children who are crying tearless tears 
they're happy kids, but the oddest system makes them miserable, makes them sad. The children are innocent and the environment of autism makes it ugly for them. There's nothing wrong with the child. It's the system's problem. So this is called hearing dominance. This is from Sophia called Lack of Deaf Identity. And it says, who am I? So you can see everything on the bottom part, there's different pieces of technology, equipment, ears and lips. And they said, I was just suffer through class. I had no sense of identity, didn't know who I was. I never thought, you know, I'm Sophia, I'm deaf. I never thought I'm a girl. Everyone else always decided for me who I was. And I'm now 50 and I'm still wondering, am I good enough? So again, that struggle with their identity, that one struck me. This was quite touching. This next one is from Laura. This also is very touching. You can see scissors in the picture. She painted, this is a self portrait of herself as a child where she cut off her FM cord, her FM devices and also cut her throat because she felt like people were trying, trying to experiment on her and force her to speak a certain way and have speech. And so she did, un, they felt like people were operating on her on her voice box. People are trying to fix and control me. And I, I scratched my eyes out here uh, because I had lack of sleep um, all day, all night. I was practicing speech 24 seven. So that's why my eyes are red here. You can see there's yellow hands up above, which are wrapped and bound. There are, I had deaf people around, but no deaf people teaching me in the educational system. If I, I know deaf people outside in the community, but not in the classroom. I didn't know anybody in the classroom. That's why her hands were bound. So they didn't have any opportunities for DCCW. All of my educators were hearing. They didn't use sign language and they didn't want me to use my hands. I was forced to put my hands in my pockets <clears throat> and think about what was going on. I was being oppressed and in pain for so many years that this became lifetime of trauma. This is from Kate. You can see the hand off to the right. You know, you can assume that deaf, maybe deaf children from deaf families don't have trauma, which is not true. There's intergenerational trauma that they get through school and friends and family members that end up being vicarious trauma, which we call it intergenerational trauma. So this one specifically is called intergenerational tr vicarious trauma. So Kate, Kate says, it's the same fight happening generation after generation. The trauma that I experience is not my trauma. I grew up at a deaf school and a deaf family, but I have vicarious trauma because I see and I dealt with it every day and it's heavy. And so we call it a war zone because we're a deaf family and we do use ASL and we're all highly educated, but it comes with great responsibility. So do people in the system, you know, they've got blood on their hands. They're causing that trauma and it's not the children's deaf or deaf people's fault. It is the system's fault. They're fighting for the future generations and I hope that would be my leg legacy. Moving on to data point five, this is the affirmative art-based research. So this is more inspiring experiences. So I just wanna take a moment, please everybody take a deep breath, take a moment to take care of yourself. This should be more on a positive note. So this is Lead Kate Family Services. It's DCCW based, it's a, it's a DCC based movement. And they said, I am thrilled to be working with Lead Kate Family Services and working with parents and parent mentors. And then later receiving a deaf coach uh, for AB 210, learning about the different language milestones. 
and then they're on the road to becoming kindergarten ready. So you can see there's a red K in the lower right hand corner. This one is from Emma. Um, when a child quote unquote, emphasize in quotes, fails, which we don't consider that a failure. We consider that a moment of celebrating. They're a deaf child, they're totally fine. So they failed the hearing screening at that time between the test to the birthing room, I'm oh, sorry, entering in the classroom, um, they're feeling confusion and not sure exactly what they need. That's where they need DCCW. They need lead K family services and their support. They need, um, you know, feelings of, of feeling confused and unsure. So this is, you see tips and advice that are being offered. This is Jaden. So this is two pieces for Jaden. Um, this is before lead K, things were very blurry and fuzzy. And then after you had the paid services, that's, what's, you know, that's what you see in the right-hand side, keeping things simple and sweet, K-I-S-S, -S, keep it simple and sweet. So from the hospital, you see the baby in the middle, in the circle, they're in, the, in their bassinet, going to the deaf community DCCW hand, which is the yellow, and the sign language that's happening around them. This is from Emily. Emily says, family is one of the biggest capital because like the heart you see here, we are the support, supporting the child with DCCW. We care about them like they're our family. When we will always be faced with resistance, but we cannot tolerate it. So we must keep the aggressors at bay and make sure that we persist with our providing DCCW with our families and beyond. This one is the non-binary approach to early educational opportunities. It's hard to just pick one. You shouldn't have to pick one. You should be able to pick American Sign Language and reading and writing English. So, you know, because it never hurts anyone to have more. So, so here's my and. So there's an ampersand in the picture in the rainbow colors. So providing more to the child, you know, ASL, DCCW, deaf schools broadens their world. This is from Mia. Mia said that sign language is the answer to establishing the foundation and early language acquisition so that deaf children can thrive. So you can see the hands are how they're blooming. You can see there's, there's five fingers. <clears throat> The hands have five fingers that represent us. We all, uh, deaf professionals, now once deaf children, the foundation of language will tell them the world is yours. This is from Sophia. She says, I am deaf. I am proud. I am an ASL user. Finding my deaf identity was almost like a stamp of approval or pride to show that I am an ASL user and I am me. So that I keep signing this, this is about losing my identity and finding my identity. So that, this is former children that, you know, use these thoughts to become their own identity, not help from, you know, their upbringing in oral education. This is work that they've done. You can see there's different pieces of tape. I am me. So that's them working on themselves and building up that identity and self-confidence. And they've struggled, but it's a continual ongoing journey. This is how powerful trauma is. So this is the same person, Laura, that cut off the FM system. So this is another piece of artwork from Laura. So first I pinned to myself and how people tried to control and oppress me. Now, my second painting is of my deaf daughter. You see the two hands that are red. The reds are signing because deaf people face many barriers in life. She is standing up and protecting our culture, language, history from these barriers. She is like Wonder Woman and protecting the deaf community with her cape. See the big D on her forehead? That's for culturally deaf, proud to be deaf. This is from Lee, opening the door requires a key. Now, who gives that key to new families? The system. Will the system show families that DCCW is the key to learning about living a fulfilled life? 
and you see the light is coming out of the keyhole in the tree. So now this is discussions and recommendations. So Connie says, we as deaf professionals can't just go forward without support that we have for each other. We can't go forward without structure and discussion with Lead K Family Services, deaf schools, different resources partnering with us. We will have better results by working together with our DCCW. So the art piece represents my attempt at integration and collaboration of our DCCW. So through this study, we were able to identify that we do have traumatic trauma knowledge. We've been hurt by the system of systematic autism that's now caused harm for over 120 years. It's actually longer than 120 years because of hearing supremacy and dominance that's causing these three specific areas, systematic autism and con consequential harm, knowledge, trauma knowledge and DCCW capital and the focusing on the whole deaf child. So the first one is language deprivation, struggles with the deaf identity and social isolation at home or school. So deaf professional trauma knowledge is providing more expertise on what not to do between the medical and the educational settings that are causing harm. We know what it is. We know that is actually the trauma capital we have to offer and should be included. The whole deaf child is number three, which is deaf professionals understand and utilizing, empowering the concept of the whole child, promoting language opportunities, DCCW resources and social needs, having that already on board for the deaf child that helps to heal the trauma or prevent trauma. This says, with trauma knowledge as a theory, we can convert our pains into, into our demand to have a voice for the medical and educational settings, settings to stop the harm they're causing on our deaf bodies with language deprivation, identity, identity development struggle, and social isolation. This is actually from my favorite author, Bell Hooks. Unfortunately, she just passed away relatively recently. So a huge uh, hats off to her. Um, it was an honor to know her. Our trauma knowledge is also our power. We know what not to do. With that, we have our new DCCW resources. We have our education capital. We know what best practices are clearly. And we have our trauma knowledge capital, which we're calling TKC. Trauma knowledge capital is TKC. So with these three specific areas, the DCCW, educational capital, TK, TKC, with all three of those different areas, we're able to um, provide all of this information to the whole deaf child and have whole deaf child expertise. This is developed from Families, family learns together. So um, all families should be receiving this. Family, linguistical, educational, aspirational, resistance, navigational, social, and trauma prevention. So the trauma prevention is there's actually three other bullet points under that. So we have the SB 210 language milestones. We have a, the deaf coach program. And the third one is critical mass, which is a minimum of eight students in each grade level class. So the families need to have this sort of checklist if they will, in addition to the language milestones. So our practice recommendations are these. The Deaf Education Office needs to be a standalone division from CDE, and actually it's now called the Office of, the office needs to set up this um, separate area, standalone division. 
So it should be a standalone division. Right now, most deaf children are under the special education division with no accountability. So all of special ed classes need to be handed over to the deaf and hard of hearing and have them specifically under the standalone division under a deaf education unit, so which we're gonna call the deaf, deaf education office. So there's more accountability with the DCCW resources, California School for the Deaf's knowledge to be able to provide support. We can't support all kids in both of the two residential deaf schools. You know, the capacity is really about 500 per, per deaf school but we're able to support regionalized support and training, which leads to the second. The Deaf Education Office will lead regionalizing of early childhood education programs for ages deaf children ages zero to five. Later, it'll be K to 12, but focusing on zero to five right now. Cal CDE, California Department of Ed, have an advisory committee working with the state board to provide statewide regionalization um, and local trainings about autism, about DCCW, about the medical and educational systems. There are many medical professionals that don't know. They're not bad people. They just don't know. They haven't been trained. They've gone to medical school and they've learned specifically about anatomy and physiology, but they have no idea about DCCW or the harm that they're causing. Last one here is DHCS and the Newborn Hearing Screening Program, NHSP, working with the California Department of Education Office, California Schools for the Deaf, Lead K Family Services, Cal Ed, California Coalition of Deaf Agencies, and the deaf, deaf stakeholders to dismantle the harmful systematic oppression. And so all, all of these, number four, lead back to number one. So we've come to the end. I've tried to condense it as much as I could in the time that we have. And so if you do have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Jack says, thank you so much. You know, this is a kind of conversation just we need to continue to have. We do have one question. Let me see if there's anything else in the Q&A. No, just that one question that's talking about the end and your framing of how to, how to work with the system. And so the last piece you've talked about those four areas and how we have the relationship with the California Department of Education and other different states that we have and how they've passed the lead K bill. What is your recommendation for the similarities with the other states, what those schools need to work on and how we can work with them. And Julia is saying that the important is about recognizing that deaf leaders are the best people to provide different resources for deaf education. We know that the schools are often small, so building regionalized programs to help support the zero to five and K to 12 ages having critical mass, mass in the school. So don't stop at just lead K laws, keep it going, keep focusing on the next steps. We're just at the beginning of this, but getting the teachers and administrators involved and having them be part of this conversation at the state level. So, you know, once you're in at the state level, you can impact tons of changes. Jack says, thank you, Julie. I do see another question has just popped up. So you can go ahead and read it if you like, but it says, what do you think of the current, current amendment of HR 5561 now on the federal floor as part of EHDI? What's your viewpoint on that? Julie's saying, so those are who are involved with trying to change the federal laws is actually Tawny Holmes. And so she's been hitting the, the floor hard, trying to make sure that you have a deaf coach and a deaf mentor with these families using that HRSA grant money. So EHDI law actually is tied into the HRSA funding. And they are submitting these, this information without deaf input. So Tawny is using her resistance capital to get deaf coaches in there. 
and making that a requirement as part of this grant. But I'm still in frustrated that they're not including our input, they're not including our expertise. It's definitely still a frustration. However, all states that are have deaf educational leaders are applying for these state grants. California has already applied to HRSA grant, uh, which comes from e EDHI. So we've taken that funding and applying it towards the lead case families, but we encourage to apply for these grants and get those funding. Jack says, I wanted to let people know, I actually looked on the chat and there are some comments about your presentation and how significant and impactful it was and lots of affirming yeses and how excellent this was. Well, it's sort of, you know, I guess thankful to the COVID era, we're able to have Zoom and the concept of, you know, people adopting using video technology. So the ideas of lead K and running classes that are hosted by deaf ASL teachers and teaching ASL to families and anybody who wants to learn ASL on a daily basis. So actually talking about lead K and family services, right? I'm assuming that's what the question was was asking about. So ASL classes are actually not a part of Lead K Family Services, but the ASL lessons are taught by Lead K Deaf coaches. So they can go to homes, they can host activities. Sometimes it's via Zoom, just depending on what the situation is. But having to be flexible and pliable and working with the families and making sure they are receiving a deaf coach for ASL lessons, for interactions with the deaf community, going to deaf events, and just being active. It's very exciting. Dakara is actually offering that. NorCal Services, um, DHS, DHHSC Deaf and Hard of Hearing Service Center in Fresno is offering GLAD uh, Deaf Community Services in San Diego, Cody in Riverside. So all of the sister agencies do have deaf coaches, which is funded by Lead K Family Services. So that's how we're able to offer American Sign Language lessons. So it's, it's more of a social aspect to the language uh, for deaf adults bringing in their DCCW. California School for the Deaf does have ASL classes for ages zero to five for um, infants and young children, their parents and families. And that's um, actually in a park off campus, again, because of COVID restrictions. So just having to be flexible with you know, today's climate. Jack says, right. Well, thank you all for participating today and joining our webinar. So a huge thank you, um, Dr. Julie Remsmario, for your expertise and sharing your wealth of knowledge and to the interpreter, Leah, and Spanish interpreter, Juan. So happy holidays, everyone. Have a great kickoff to 2022. Wow. I can't believe, you know, it's all the different 20s in 2020. I can't believe 2022. Looking forward to it. So everybody have a good day. Have a great weekend.